Well, thanks everybody. I'm sorry for whatever happened, um, and but I thank you for bearing with us, and thanks for being here. So, uh, um, launch in, and I might uh, cut one or two things. But Tom had asked me to uh, try to review some basic coastal engineering principles that are useful to uh, the Sage Group and uh, look at various coastal adaptation methods. I will say I'll, I'm going to go pretty late on technical detail. It's really oriented to a non-engineering audience, And uh, but please contact me if you have any questions and I'd be glad to uh, explore things with you. Um, civil engineering is a mix of civil engineering along with um, coastography and some coastal geology. And coastal engineers get involved in quite a few types of projects. I, I won't list them or I won't name them all here, but um, uh, we'll talk a few of these as we go today to discuss. Uh, first of all, let's talk about water levels, and we'll talk about tides, tidal datums, um, sea level rise, and storms. Well, then the waves. Uh, I think a lot of coastal engineers feel that if you don't get the waves right, you'll never get the project right, so we'll spend some time there. Uh, we'll sediment transport issues and try to look at uh, some basic principles there. And then I'll try to wrap up by touching on different adaptation methods and trying to show how we apply some of these principles. So first, just talk briefly about tides. Um, the top, picture at the top is a snapshot of about two weeks of uh, tidal variation. Uh, we're more interested, though, in average tide levels, what's so called tidal datums. And the idea here is that we're going to take a certain tidal characteristic and average it over a 19-year tidal epoch, which is the longest length of time where the sun and the moon and the earth uh, evolve to create the tides. So, for example, MLLW, mean or low water, is the average of the lowest daily low tides for 19 years. So if we have two low tides here in Annapolis, we would take the lowest one Mean lower, we would average the two low tides for 19 years, and and so forth for others. And what we'd like to do then, typically in the lower right, is take tidal datum elevations and apply them to a shoreline or a structure to give ourselves a vertical reference. Well, those tidal datums have the annoying uh, pretty of changing with uh, sea level rises. So over time, they tend to drift upward. So in response to that, we also tend to use uh, geodetic datums. So these are references that are tied to the Earth's geoid, and we'll establish they're considered fixed uh, from that point forward. And I'll point out, you will often see NGVD, uh, National Geodetic Vertical Datum. Uh, it is being phased out, but you'll still see it in some legacy projects. And now you'll be looking at NAVD, North American Vertical Datum of 1988. So that's the current standard that FEMA uses for flood insurance, and it's the most common reference level for most uh, coastal projects. Well, I'll talk a little more about this tidal epoch issue. So the, the slide here shows uh, mean sea level uh, in Willis, Maryland from our tide gauge, and uh, uh, inflations are based on monthly and uh, decadal type anomalies in sea level, but you can see rising on average. The R represents the last most recent tidal epoch uh, from 1982 to 2001, and it's centered on 1992. So basically, if you look up the official mean sea level dim in Annapolis today, it's simply frozen at 1992 levels. And I think it's just a good uh, word warning because we're uh, almost a quarter of a century later and obviously our sea levels have risen. So you can be off immediately on uh, your reference elevations relative to the published tidal datum. Uh, the top picture is a year of tide data in Annapolis. Uh, blue is uh, predicted and is measured, and at the right are the official tidal datums uh, on the same scale. Uh, the right then shows just the last month of December uh, in this case. And the first point is, I think you can see that on average, our predicted tides are well, uh, uh, our, excuse me, our measured tides in green are well of our predicted tides. And in part, again, that's due to the fact that predicted tides 
uh, and title datums are based on that last title epoch and do account for any recent level of sea level rise. Uh, so I think important for projects in bay and estuaries, um, wind barometric pressure can cause local wave set, uh, water level set up or set down, small storm surges, if you will, uh, that can dominate the tides in small bays and estuaries. And that's certainly true here in Annapolis. So basically, you would really never want to go with the predicted tides. You would want to understand your measured tides. Uh, sea level rise, uh, coastal engineers are, I think, using the same basic scenario planning that, that most of all you are probably from different uh, federal agencies or national agencies. At the time then is an example of how at the Naval Academy we've been projecting forward using the NOAA projections for uh, 2050. Again, uh, just the key point that the starting point for those is 1992, the last title effort. Well, uh, you know, mean sea level is part of the problem, but storms are uh, uh, maybe a larger part of the problem. And uh, this slide tries to illustrate some work we've been doing. Uh, Left-hand um, curve is the mean sea level, the monthly mean sea level here in Annapolis, obviously on an upward trend. And then we have four future sea level scenarios going off to the year 2100. Uh, level from my building, uh, the Rico Hall, and you can see that. Um, at least for the future, uh, sea level rise scenarios are going to uh, potentially reach over the top of our building level uh, century. But to the left, the upper curve represents the extreme high water, the monthly highest water level uh, in an So this would encompass all of the major and minor storm events that caused the highest monthly water level. Uh, 2003, our storm of record is, is Hurricane Isabel. For some of you on the East Coast. Well, generally what we can do is um, we can then look at, for example, statistics of the extremes and come up with uh, representative levels for uh, maybe the 100 year recurrence interval or the 10 year recurrence and all interval events like that. Well, now back forward. Um, if we go forward in time, now we're going to, out to the year 2100, pick one particular sea level rise scenario. In here, so lower red curve is that uh, lowest scenario. That scenario. Um, the uh, the uh, irregular curve then is basically a random sampling from storm statistics in the past, uh, replaying and resampling storms into the future. So this is a step that the storm statistics don't get more severe or more frequent. So we'll put that issue aside. It's the statistics as in the past, but just riding on top of the future sea level. And I think the point I wanted to make here was uh, these storms are going to pass our flood threshold of my building uh, much more frequently. And eventually, every single month, uh, we're getting events higher than that. And so uh, the extreme events, the 10 year, 100 year, or even 500 year events also are rising with sea level. And as a result, uh, um, the day's 100 year event, if you project it forward, uh, maybe less than a 10-year event by the year 2100. This is something we need to, you know, spend a little more time on factoring in this uh, storm frequency into projects. The waves uh, now, and uh, the top picture just shows a sample of, of might be 60 was in a cycle uh, plot against time, and um, I want to try to quickly identify some of the key parameters that you'll frequently see when you talk about waves. So one is the peak wave period. And uh, basically, uh, on a time scale, we would, we would go from one wave to the next. And typically, the peak wave period has very specific mathematical definitions. But you can think of it as a typical period between larger or more dominant waves in the random sea. So it's a commonly used parameter. We also get then to calculate the peak wavelength and the, the wave would be the distance in feeders from wave crest to the next. And it turns out in deep water, it's related to the wave period, so that the wavelength is uh, proportional to gravity, or is equal to gravity times the period squared divided by 2 pi. So the thing is, the wavelength depends on wave period squared. The longer the wave periods, then the longer the wavelengths, 
and I'll, I'll come to that point uh, later on in, in the talk. Uh, for height, the most commonly used is in red, the significant wave height, HMO. And the key point here is that it's really a statistical wave. It's not an actual wave. It's a uh, wave height that goes from some statistical trough, the lower point, to a crest, the higher point. And it's defined in a couple different ways. But in this graph, it would be the average of the one third largest waves in the sea state. And if we have 60 waves here, it would be the average height of the 20 largest. And I think you can think, just in very intuitive statistics, that if you're averaging those 20, at least 10 waves should be larger than the significant wave height. So this is usually the height reported on almost all the time for coastal products. And uh, I think it's good to be aware that, that there are larger waves out there. And uh, eventually, you get up to the maximum wave height in the sea state. And this is, of course, a poorly defined statistic. But I, as a rule of thumb, I like to uh, think of this, that the maximum wave is usually about 1.5 to 2 times the significant wave height. Yeah, so that gives you a good scale for what the wave conditions are like. Now, as a Come deep to shallow water. Um, the, the first thing I think in the upper left hand picture is uh, the motions in deep water decay with depth. And uh, by the time you get down to a depth of half the wavelength, uh, there really are no perceptible wave motions below that. And until the waves come in close to shore and they reach a depth of half the wavelength where the waves first feel the bottom and the bottom first feels the wave. Uh, fair transitional zone where things get a little complicated, but finally get into very shallow water. And this is, of course, where most of our projects are. And uh, in shallow water, and comparing to deep water, uh, the wave period stays the same as a parameter. The weed decreases. So waves are slowing down as they get into shallow water. And usually the speed is the square root of gravity times water depth. So if you depth, you can make a very good prediction of the shallow water wave speed. Uh, is really just that speed times the wave period. So the length in shallow water is diminishing or decreasing. So waves slowing down, they're bunching together, and it turns out that in order to keep transferring energy uh, at the same level, the weight is going to increase in shallow water. Now, and that's uh, through the process we call shoaling. And that's as long as there's no breaking and energy is conserved. In the picture, up until the point where the white water appears, shoal would be the guarding process, and we would expect the waves to increase in height up to that point. Well, it can't increase forever, and eventually they become unstable and break. Breaking, uh, finally, we get the beginning of a significant wave energy dissipation or attenuation. And little rules of thumb, I think, for very shallow water. Uh, the Army Corps of Engineers, USAC, use a shallow water depth limited significant wave height of six times the water depth, 60% of the water depth. And what that means is, is would be smaller than that, but if they try to get any bigger, the breaking is so intense that it dissipates energy back down to that level. So based as a rule of thumb, the wave heights cannot exceed that that level in, uh, in shallow water. Now, individual maximum waves, they can be bigger, and there's some rules of thumb for those as well that I've listed here. Again, roughly 50, uh, one five to two times significant height. And to note then that uh, the actual conditions depend on uh, complicated uh, relationships between bottom slope, wave period, and other factors. And the dog. <laughs> Uh, okay, for those that have a dog, I gave her a good bone earlier and tried to keep her quiet, but apparently it didn't work. Uh, and I just made a note that uh, if we start to think of adaptation methods, what we have is that the limited water depth in the seafloor with breaking can cause this type of wave reduction, and then we can further uh, reduce waves, hopefully, with uh, either rough bottoms in a reef or with vegetation. Other than convey what FEMA uses in the federal flood insurance, it's a little different. Uh, 
Uh, look at a wave height at the bottom that's 78% of the depth. In my opinion, a little low, um, but uh, it's a number that does crop up in the literature frequently. So that's their sort of maximum wave height. What I do like with FEMA is they recognize that in a wave profile at the top, uh, you know, wave height H from trough to crest, the crescent is about 70% of that. So waves get very kind of uh, narrow and peaked, and they can rise to quite high elevation. It's the uh, depth with flooding plus the wave crest, which gives FEMA's base flood elevation. And it, uh, then uh, issue is why breaking waves so damaging. If you look at damage and storms, it's really the brain waves that are the main cause of uh, adduction. And the basic idea is that fluid velocities are, highest, are highest near the wave crest and are smaller near the seafloor. So the picture bottom and the numerical simulation at the bottom are trying to illustrate that uh, wave velo wind velocities, wave motions are much higher up in the wave crest region, and particularly if the waves start to break. And as a result, if any part of the structure of a structure gets hit by that part of the wave, you can develop very large wave slamming forces. And uh, as illustrated in the upper right, uh, what FEMA recommends, of course, is to then add substantial freeboard to that, get the first floor above the wave crest, and then add freeboard to give a margin of safety. All right, they also uh, drive nearshore currents, and uh, a couple that I'll just mention. On the left, if waves break at an angle to the shoreline, uh, going to drive a longshore current parallel to the shoreline. Uh, with breaking waves in the current, this, of course, can pick up sand and drive a longshore sediment transport, or what's sometimes called the littoral drift. And right, then, uh, if you put a structure, like a groin or a jet, in that system, uh, you know then that sand will deposit or be trapped on what's called the updrift side and erode on what's called the downdrift side. So you'll hear the terms updrift and downdrift referred to uh, structural effects. Um, shore, perpendicular to shore, you also have a current system generated. Um, the break waves tend to drive a flow of water toward shore up in the surface region, polar region where the white water is. Uh, that can't go on forever, and eventually that gets redirected and sent back out to sea. It's the phenomenon we call the undertow. And of course, that can carry sand and other things with it. Other wave modifications, uh, waves refract in the upper left. So the fraction is based on, on distortions of the wave that might be trailing in different water depths. So in the picture, uh, if the water depth depth off of a point of land or a headland is shallower and what deeper going into a bay, um, shallower part of the wave travels more slowly and the deeper water travels faster. So the wave crests tend to bend, wave energy tends to converge or diverge. So what will happen is the bend waves will focus wave energy on the headlands and divergence of the wave energy in the embayment. And it's a great trick if you can use that in adaptation to try to take advantage of that divergence in the bay. And the upper waves also diffract. So if you go through a slit between waters, for example, or if they go around the end of breakwaters, wave energy will go laterally into the shadow zone behind the structure. And as that happens, the wave energy is fanning out in a circular pattern. And while it's happening, the wave heights are naturally diminishing. Also a useful thing, as we'll see later, for an adaptation. At the bottom, it also reflect off, off anything vertical, a uh, vertical wall, or off of impermeable, very steep structures, or even beaches. Uh, but reflection off of, of uh, vertical walls is a typical problem, uh, because you, you have incident waves coming toward the wall, and eventually you're redirecting wave energy back in the opposite direction and with these reflected waves. So then you have the instant waves adding or superimposing to the reflected waves. And you can get very large, sometimes almost a doubling of wave height at the wall, which means these have to be higher uh, than maybe otherwise expected. 
And then on the wave front, uh, let me talk about wave run up. So if we've, if, if we've dissipated some energy through braking, eventually, um, and it, not all of it, eventually that remaining wave energy reaches a shoreline or a sloping structure, sort of a last conversion of all that wave motion into a put up the slope of the structure to a maximum elevation, which we call the wave run up. And so this distance R from a still water level up to the top of the waves often is a controlling factor on what's happening either on beaches or structures. Uh, the gram is a, a bit old, but I really like this one because it shows some things hopefully clearly. Uh, the land scale is the wave run up divided by the wave height. Okay. Uh, various curves have wave height and wave period in them. I just shade the region where most kind of storm wave conditions would be that we're mainly concerned about. And then the axis is the inverse of the structure slope. Now, uh, typical sand beaches uh, typically would have a slope of one unit vertically to 10 units horizontally, or maybe flatter, one to 50, something like that. And sand beaches are very good dissipators of energy. So if you look at the range of conditions here, and over, you're going to see that on sand beaches, the rub is pretty small, 10, 20 percent, 40 percent of the offshore wave height. In common, we build uh, seawall or uh, armoring structures in the upper right. We almost always use very, very sl steep slopes, one vertical, one and a half horizontal to something like one on three. And if you look at those fall, uh, you can see that steep structures are going to give you a rub that could be uh, roughly twice the income wave height. So I tell students, basically, when, when we build structures, we're building amplifiers, and we're, we're applying the wave run up compared to beaches. And of course, if you're trying on these structures to prevent water from going over the top, you then, of course, have to build them quite high. Uh, levees and flood control structures with grass slopes are usually somewhere in between. Uh, we often like to use something like one on five slopes, and I think you can see there, uh, still the run-up is quite high, and as a result, those have to be quite high. Okay, well, sediments, and, and make a few comments about the sediments and sediment transport. So first of all, uh, if, if you sand at a given location, it almost always has a wide range of sediment sizes. And as all, we usually use at the rate some sort of a probability distribution to get that reflect the distribution of rain sizes. So kind of percentage of a sample, the sediment size, as in this one, don't be surprised if the scale is reversed. That's sometimes often used. Uh, typically characterize the grain size in millimeters, almost exclusively. And what we're usually after are a couple key parameters. First of all, if we go at the 50% on our probability, Read, over, read down, that's what we call the median grain diameter, D50. So it's probably most commonly reported grain size. Um, on the other hand, we're also sometimes interested in either the percentage of the sample that's very coarse or very fine. And I've circled over here on the lower right, typically the dividing line between fine sand and salt and clay is something like 0 0.075 millimeters. And interested in, as maybe in this upper sample, is determining uh, what percentage of the sediment sample is in that fine range. And part of the reason for that is that we know that if we're going to use that sand on an open beach, usually that fine material, since it's so powdery when it's dry, it goes in suspension and it's just not stable in waves and currents. Uh, the coarse sand goes up to about 4.75, about P size. So if you remember P to power, uh, in terms of size range, that pretty much encompasses sand in the system. Response. Um, under wave conditions, the, the type you would see day in and day out, typically, uh, it turns out that most sediment transport on a beach is onshore. And uh, so typically, those normal wave conditions, um, the, the cause them to stay down right on the sea floor and kind of scoot up the beach face. Uh, obviously, that happens with seashells and larger particles preferentially, since you find them, you know, a shoreline. 
But that happens. What we find is the beach typically becomes pretty steep, the beach face, and we typically develop what's called a beach berm, a well-defined upper area that almost looks like a little ridge up at the limit of wave runup. On, the, on those uh, times when we have storm conditions with elevated waves, lots of energy dissipation, those days we're also generating a strong undertow. And typically, sediment transport is offshore. So typically, we're going to erode the berm, move it offshore, sometimes into a sandbar system. Occasionally, you'll see these vertical erosion scarps, which is a great sure sign that the beach is eroding. So here's an example of this transition. So in the state of Delaware, uh, um, uh, 2009 in this data, uh, here's a, a beach berm in July going down to the shoreline. In August, the beach berm elevation has grown. The beach has steepened a bit. In the fall, with a couple storms, the beach erodes back and erodes back further. And that's the typical response that you see. What you can't see, though, is that hopefully that sand has moved offer and is deposited in this amount in here. And hopefully with a return to normal conditions, uh, then we'll start to work its way back and this cycle will be repeated next year or next season. Useful uh, and widely um, used principles in uh, beach characteristics is called equilibrium beach profile theory. And is that for many years people observed that Beaches usually have a concave shape from the shine out. In other, in other words, they drop off pretty steeply and then kind of flatten out. Uh, Bob Dean uh, derived this shape, given here mathematically. And the thing about his derivation, in my opinion, is that he derived it as a shape which gives the most efficient wave energy dissipation for, for beach. So that's the particular shape, and it's often used in coastal projects. One parameter, the, the parameter A, and I should have mentioned this relates water depth at a given distance offshore. The parameter A has been strongly correlated to sediment size, D50, that we saw earlier. And what we've learned, of course, from that uh, is that basically, uh, sand, here the 0.3 millimeter, is a steeper average profile than finer sand. They both have the same mathematical sh shape. In terms of the actual slopes involved, the finer sand will have a milder slopes, coarser sand, and steeper slopes. And here's an example of applying that to uh, some beach profile from Virginia Beach. Uh, this does describe the sandbars and troughs. You kind of have to smooth them out in your mind. Uh, the equilibrium profile otherwise describes that average shape. And it gives you a nice, uh, simple relationship to use to define distance shore and an expected water depth. Down often when you get to bays and estuaries. Um, bays and estuaries have a wide range of beach and sediment types, and uh, so it's really hard to uh, generalize. Um, it's all sand. So if it's all sand size material, and we have quite a few of those here in the Chesapeake Bay, uh, they do behave like ocean beaches for the most part. So pretty much what we've talked about still holds true. And if you have um, a lot of silt, clay, organics, peat uh, kind of thing, or if you have hard clay outcroppings, then you're not going to find this same equilibrium shape. And I guess, unfortunately, at this point, I don't think there's any unified description of what bay and estuary shorelines should look like. Back to kind of uh, ocean beach dynamics. Um, for predict long term beach change, a couple of basic principles are used. Uh, this one is that uh, the upper limit of beach change is generally known. It, it's the beach berm. That's the limit of wave run up on the beach. So, so that's the best point that sediment will be transported with the exception of the occasional large storm. On the, um, offshore, the upper limit of typical beach change is something we call the depth of closure. And we typically find it at the bottom is plot quite a few different beach profiles taken at different times and looking for the point where these close out. That is, they pin together and where there's no more really observable 
measurable beach change. So this is not a fast rule. It's not the limit of sediment movement. We know that sand can still move out here, but it seems to be the limit where we can measure and quantify beach change. And I've put some limits on things. On the East Coast, the berm, 7 to 10 feet above mean sea level, the depth of measure, maybe 20 to 30 feet below. Um, Pacific with longer wave periods, uh, higher berm, deeper depth of closure. Gulf of Mexico, less wave run up, so the berm, not deep on depth of closure. And estuary, if you're in sandy beach environments, uh, kind of took a guess at some ranges there. Well, finally, to I guess what most coastal engineers would say is the number one principle of coastal engineering and conservation of sand. So it is that for the most part, for beaches, sand is not created or destroyed. Now, there are areas, South Florida, for example, where biogenic production adds to the sediment characteristics, or maybe you have areas where fine silt may get washed out. But for the most part, uh, if you're looking in a sand environment, uh, whatever sand is there is essentially some kind of a finite volume uh, and not being created or destroyed. As you have uh, erosion or accretion, uh, sand can conserved. And it's important, uh, obviously, after storms, always see headlines that be eroded, sand was lost. Um, but the key thing is it's still in the system. So and the question is, can you find it uh, conveniently? It mentions uh, what we did is that we can make a balance in the cross-sectional area eroded with the area deposited much like that Delaware example I showed earlier. What we typically do is in engineering is apply a control volume approach. So we box around a section of the coast, try to look at erosion or accretion within the box as related to any flow of sand that crosses the boundaries of that control volume. So here's examples. Uh, I know a lot of you have dealt with the Brune rule, the solution for change due to sea level rise. Uh, I've given my version of a picture at the bottom. Uh, the Brune rule encompasses quite a few of these principles we've talked about. The idea, though, is that we start with an initial profile, which we assume some kind of equilibrium. Uh, is we raise the profile and shift it landward, and we shift landward a distance r until the erosion in the upper area in here, here position down here. So we apply conservation of sand principles. We principle where the upper limit might be the beach berm, lower limit might be a little different notation, but the depth of closure. I'll just note that this has been modified by quite a few people for lots of other conditions, but the fundamental aspects of it uh, follow some of these principles we talked about. In uh, we might do a control volume approach is something like this. Now I've simplified this. Uh, at a beach, I've drawn a box around it. We come distance along shore. Delta Y might be a, you know, a couple kilometers. Uh, identified the vertical height, berm to depth of closure. The idea now is that we can look at longshore sediment transport coming into a system on the one end and long transport going out on the other end. And in this, if the outflow is bigger than the inflow, sand out of our control volume and the beach has to erode to provide that sand. And it can basically make a very simple geometric argument that if we know volume change over time and if we know the literal and vertical limits of our uh, change, we can then solve for the retreat of the profile. And this assumes that maybe if the beach looks something like this, that it's still in some sort of an equilibrium and maintaining that, that basic shape. In add other things, so we can try to account for flow in, in and out of our box to the offshore, if we have reason to believe that uh, we're changed there. We can account for sand mining or overwash and storms. And then from an engineering perspective, the big one is to account for any beach fills as being a net addition into the system. Okay, we've caught a print principles on the way of uh, water levels, waves, and sediments. So what I'd like to do now is to try to focus on just a few, I guess, adaptations 
some principles and um, see how some of those principles are used. Uh, stepping back a bit, I sort of subscribe to the triple approach to uh, collision and flooding, and that is you basically have three choices. Uh, you abandon, armor, adapt, and you you probably in the Sage group been involved in your own version of these. So, uh, you know, obviously, uh, I'll take a look at each of these a little bit, but um, I want to try to see how these principles might might come into play. In a minute, um, I just have one slide here. We've been seeing a lot of elevation, of course, uh, in structures. Uh, gets them out of harm's way of being out of flood levels and out of wave crests. So that's sort of a local, uh, uh, local location, if you will, of using a structure. Uh, we've seen Kimberly might be an example of entire communities that are becoming unsustainable to maintain them and armor them. Uh, so consideration giving to move them completely. And then, you know, we've also got the managed realignment type concepts. And um, you know, I think if you think about what we've said, wave attenuation uh, would be that um, you know instead of having a structure like a flood control structure sitting out where it's directly exposed to waves, the idea might be to set it back and then use sand beach or use salt marsh, oyster reefs, or other living organisms to try to uh, diminish and attenuate the waves before they reach a relocated or realigned structure. Coastal arm, uh, so there's a lot of it around. Um, I will, I think uh, it really has one purpose, and it's, uh, that is to protect the island. And if that's the goal that it's measured against, it can be successful uh, when properly designed. But it's not intended to protect the beach or what's in front of it. And uh, that, I think, it gives most of these structures a bad name as far as their impact on the surrounding coast. But structures can work primarily by dissipating or reflecting wave energy. And the vertical wall at the top is intended to reflect most wave energy, and it doesn't dissipate much at all. So the wave environment in here, if, if there's a boat wake or some other type of wave, is basically going to be the superposition of incident and reflected, and it can get you know pretty choppy and, and pretty difficult. But things at the bottom, like these temporary sandbag uh, structures, they're very impermeable. Uh, they also reflect most wave energy rather than really effectively dissipate it. Uh, the structure in the middle is the only that really dissipates wave energy to any extent. But that one of the principles of waves is that when you build a steep slope, you amplify the wave run up. We need structures so that water does not go over the top of them in waves. So normally they have to be pretty high. And then lastly, it turns out that the stone weight if you build one of these stone revetments or seawalls, is proportional to the wave height cubed. So it, it doesn't take much of a change in wave height to cause stone weights to go up dramatically. And if, if the stones are too small, uh, they can move. So the bottom line is, I guess, armoring structures, they tend to be high, they tend to be massive. And if stone, they tend to use large armor stone. In order to do their job, they've got to encompass all that. Well, they all have a lot of implications as far as the beach, and I'm not going to try to summarize all of them. But we do know, at least from what we saw today, that seawalls and uh, vaulted things are going to disrupt the natural processes of beach characteristics and, and hand movement, and certainly disrupt the equilibrium beach shape that you would expect. But also, seawalls tend to block upland sand from feeding the active system. So if you put a head and you prevent sediment behind it from being activated and brought into the active beach, until you deny a source of sand into your control volume. And based on our conservation of sand principle, you can expect that, that be going to erode somewhere else. So a lower right hand picture, if a party owner protects themselves here, they act to trap some sand on the updrift side, but they certainly are denying sand from entering the system, and the end result is erosion on the downdrift side. Which brings us uh, coastal groins um, also have been widely 
used as a sort of murmuring structure. Um, some preferential, I guess, because they do at least have a sandy shoreline that results. But, but the design goal of a groin, if you build it, is literally to trap part of that longshore transport. And coming back to our conservation of sand principle, every grain that you trap on one side is a grain that never makes it to the other side. And by the time you uh, accumulate those, you can get very large erosion down the drift. And if you have a groin field at the right, uh, every groin is trapping something. Uh, the depth area in the foreground has to take up the entire uh, deficit of sand that's happened. So just remember that updrift accretion and downdrift erosion have to be in balance. Okay, so more adaptation approaches. Uh, just to say one thing about um, real local beneficial use of sediment. You know, we, we are dredging a lot of navigation channels deeper and deeper and generating a lot of sediment. Uh, thing I think these days is that we now have used dredge sediment as a resource, and I think all coastal engineers do. Uh, we don't call it dredge spoil anymore, and it's not. Um, and in the old days, the least cost um, way of getting rid of it was to take it offshore and dump it, but that is generally not true anymore either. So these days, what we're going to do is, if it's beach quality sand that we get near an entrance channel, we're probably going to put it on adjacent beaches. And if it's clean, fine sediment uh, and sand, we're probably going to use it beneficially for wetlands restoration. Um, sometimes this comes to play, as the Corps of Engineers calls it, regional sediment management. And that's really just trying to conserve sand in the regional system so that if you take sediment out of one part of the system, you can use it for adjacent projects but keep it in that general system. Okay, this is another one. Uh, a lot of our problems on the open coast and even on bays and estuaries like here in the Chesapeake, due to the effects of tidal inlets and jetties trapping sand on one side and leading to erosion on the other side. With sand bypassing, the idea is that we mechanically transfer sand through some kind of a dredging mechanism from accumulation, either the updrift side, as shown in the lower right, or maybe from the shoal system that forms, basically mechanically pass it and move it along. So this is to longshore transport and again, to conserve sediment in the system. Uh, River Inlet, Delaware, just as an example, they have a mobile dredge that takes material from the accretion zone, pumps it via pipeline over the bridge, deposits it over in the dive. Uh, beach snark is probably is the most widely used method of open coast erosion and flood control by far. Um, I spent four years on the Corps of Engineers Coastal Engineering Research Board talking about core projects and R&D. We discussed a single R structure in four years, and we discussed uh, on the open coast almost nothing but beach nourishment projects. Beach nourishment, um, um, about it, I think it's, uh, it does sand as a natural material, and I think that's a big benefit of this type of project. Um, because of that, it's you know, very adaptable, and uh, and we can change the uh, characteristics at any time. It does both erosion and flood protection, as the core is storm damage reduction, and that's both by advancing the profile seaward, but also by building the beach berm and maybe the sand dune. I uh, recognize, though, that it does not alter or change the wave climate, so uh, the beach will continue to erode if it was eroding before. We're going to have to manage it long term through periodic renourishment. And the way the way beach nourishment works is sediment conservation and equilibrium concepts combined. We basically take an initial beach uh, with berm elevation and depth of closure, and we basically instruction overbuild the beach berm, terminate it in some kind of a fairly steep slope. Uh, as earlier, uh, beaches don't like steep linear slopes, they like concave uh, profiles. What's happened over time is that waves will erode the upper part, the beach berm and the upper part of the beach and shift sand offshore eventually out toward the depth of closure. And hopefully what we regain over time is 
psych are same beach shape. You might call that the equilibrium, but shifted seaward. And what I think is maybe one of the most important principles of beach nourishment, um, and one of the best parts about it. Uh, the idea of beach nourishment generally is to add sand into our control volume by bringing it in from offshore, where it's probably out beyond the closure. What we do is go out and look for sand that's sort of in a relic state beyond the active beach system, deeper water, and bring it back into the active beach system. I mentioned this is Delray Beach, Florida. Uh, some good things, I think, again, they're very adaptable. You can change all kinds of things about them. In the Florida, they have uh, a lot of, uh, you know, turtle uh, templates for sea turtle nesting. Uh, they're very disruptive in terms of dredging and uh, placement of sediment, so there's a lot of environmental impacts. Um, the only I really have, I, I'm actually quite a proponent of them. I think it's a good way to go compared to the other alternative of uh, armoring. Uh, question is how sustainable are they for future sea level rise? So, so the picture bottom shows in Delray Beach, they, they pump in blue about uh, 1.6 million cubic yards of sand on the beach in 1973. Um, and they monitor the volume, but they've done uh, five pumping episodes since. Uh, I probably need to continue the diagram. But they had a net gain of sand volume. They've had a substantial net gain of beach width. They provided the protection, uh, and recreational enhancement that they're looking for. Uh, the question is how far into the future can we do this with rising seas? Turn to other uh, versions of adaptation. So one that, uh, another one is an intelligent use of structures. Uh, right is an aerial picture of uh, rocky headlands with pocket beaches. And the nice thing about existing natural systems like that is headlands effectively dissipate a wave energy, waves diffract and also refract into the embayment to spread the energy out in these pocket beaches. What we do a lot of in the Chesapeake Bay and other places is build rock breakwaters, some called headland breakwaters, tenage of dissipating energy there, but allow energy to diffract between them and the diffracted waves form these naturally circular pocket beaches. And I think of advantages that you are actually changing wave climate. They're kind of an offensive weapon in our arsenal. Uh, they out and dissipate energy and then alter the remaining energy to look at, at the shoreline. Uh, you obtain a soft shoreline, you can plant fringe wetlands, and brings into another, another equilibrium principle that I have not talked about, but the principle of equilibrium plan forms. The fact that these circular embayments are very stable, very predictable, and they serve sand because it's very difficult for sand to get out of the systems. Living example of combining, uh, maybe combining structures with uh, natural systems. Um, typical in this instance is using low zone sills a way to both uh, provide initial wave attenuation, but also to hold uh, fill and protect uh, wetlands grasses. And then the grass does the rest, if you will, of dissipating remaining wave energy. So a lot of we're talking about other alternatives, things like submerged reefs uh, as a way to um, help with flooding or attenuation. And as I see it, submerged reefs really have no impact on storm surge at least at the scales that we're talking about. They're not a flooding solution, but they can be a wave attenuation solution. Um, but we at, at the bottom, if you design a stone reef breakwater that's just a little bit below the water level, the depth of submergence and the width of the structure is very important. Similarly, at the top, a picture of some reef balls in a lab test. But we, if you build these too narrow, or if you build them too deep, then have very little effect on waves. If you remember on your slide, most of the wave motion is up at the surface. That's where strong velocities are. And so if you submerge these structures uh, too deeply, they simply have the velocity field and not able to dissipate much wave energy. It's most effective if they're very close to still water level, emergent, and if they're very wide. And you know, 
lower right picture, if you're looking at natural coral reefs, uh, you know, usually very shallow, uh, the shiftness itself induces wave breaking. Uh, they're close to the surface, so that allows the roughness of the reef to affect those strong wave velocities, and they're very wide. And so my, my rule of thumb, and this is not cast in stone, but if you're going to build a reef like one of these, it really needs to be about as wide across the crest as your shallow water wavelength that we talked about a while ago. So we constructed wetlands, um, somewhat similar. Um, I think we know that, that uh, you know, it seeks its own level quite efficiently, and uh, well, they have very little impact on storm surge unless they're very wide. So I'm kind of talking Louisiana wide here. Um, certainly at the type of scale that we would look at them here in the Chesapeake, uh, where we might try to establish a couple acres or, or uh, uh, in, of uh, wetlands, uh, they're probably not going to have any significant impact on flooding. But they've been shown to attenuate waves. And uh, similar to the reef breakwater, uh, we know a couple things. The, the picture at the right from the Corps of Engineers, we do know again that wave velocities are largest at the surface, smallest at the bottom. So to be most effective, vegetation has to be emergent, or at least very close to the surface. Deeply submerged, it's going to have very little impact. On wave energy. Similar to them, you can draw a similar analogy to the width uh, of the. So, uh, I think one of the things with wetlands that we have to always consider is that they're actually going to be more effective, even an urgent one, under normal conditions. Often they're completely flooded and covered under storm conditions and, and therefore less effective. So, finally, if you can bear with me that long. So, as you start to think about different adaptation methods, Methods, I have to think about a very rough energy balance. So if you think of wave energy, and I'd say wave energy is proportional to the wave height squared. You can keep that in the back of your mind. But if we think of wave energy in here, and a certain amount of incident wave energy coming in toward a shoreline or a, a system, uh, there are only three things that can happen to it. Uh, right, you can transmit it so it can continue on in the same direction. You it, that is, redirect it and send it back out where it came from, um, or dissipate it and try to get rid of that uh, energy through dissipation. And as I say, there really are kind of three main dissipation mechanisms. Bring is very effective, limited shallow water. Bottom can be very effective if you can get the roughness up near the surface. And station can be effective, again, if you can get it up near the surface. And particularly, both of these are, are useful if they're very wide. So you can start to think of a kind of a continuum of solutions. I won't read everything. But natural sand beaches are probably the best dissipative system we know of. On the other extreme, a vertical bulkhead is the most reflective. Other things are going to fall somewhere in between. So think of dissipating energy versus transmitting it. Um, is hopefully don't dissipate any, or uh, sorry, dissipate everything, don't transmit. Very narrow or deeply submerged reefs or wetlands, we're going to transmit most of it. So it leads us to think of uh, adaptation methods as systems where we might layer. Uh, here's a, a, a picture I really like with um, a liver line and uh, with a rock sill. I'd expect that low and high tide, it works effectively. If energy, it dissipates a lot of energy. It emits some. And then have different uh, grasses, uh, either submerged or on the beach, that or the beach itself, that can handle the remaining wave energy. During the tide, you know, you deeply submerge this structure, so it's going to reflect less, dissipate less, transmit more. And then you need to have other things in place back in here to handle those extreme water levels. And similar um, my slide is that with this layered approach, um, you can uh, enhance wave attenuation by thinking of systems uh, in series, to bring out an engineering uh, analogy we like. Uh, like the reef at the beginning. So uh, we might have incident waves coming in. We will reflect some, dissipate some, 
transmit some. So HT is a transmitted wave height. Hopefully grass helps reduce that. Uh, the beach may slope, so it may shoal. We might actually get a little growth in wave height, but now what transmitted wave here becomes the incident wave here. And now we have another system that can try to, to again, reflect uh, dissipate energy and hopefully at the end transmit rather than a little. So with that, two things. I apologize first of all for our uh, beginning. We got a late start. I hope many of you stayed with me and thanks for uh, uh, paying attention and I'll be glad to stay on as long as anybody wants to deal with questions. Thank you. Dr. Kriebel, thank you so much for a terrific primer on all those fundamentals uh, and, and did it in less than an hour. So we we really appreciate you uh, share, sharing all your knowledge with us, which was great. Um, we do have a couple of questions uh, before, and you didn't lose anybody, which is another uh, tribute to how great your talk was. Um, I mentioned before people might start to, to uh, leave that um, our applications are all posted on our project website, resilient-infrastructure.org. And under patients, that will take you to uh, YouTube postings for all of our presentations that we had in our webinar series. And Dr. Kriebel has kindly agreed to allow us to record this, and we'll post that uh, soon. I'll go ahead and I'll read a couple of questions that I did receive. Uh, Don, a question, which is when. I want to hear his. So. <laughs> no. <laughs> I I'll need to settle that offline. Um, he was asking, when can we expect a new national tide epic and updated datums from NOAA? Uh, that's a good question, Don, and I, ha I really have the same question myself, and I just have not had a chance to contact NOAA. I, I had a goal of every 25 years on average, so that would not necessarily be back-to-back, -back, uh, but that means that we ought to be getting it, uh, started on that fairly soon. Um, in some areas, you might have noticed in Louisiana, where they have extremely rapid sea level rise, they've actually gone to sort of a mini epic, a five-year period, to try to date things at a faster interval. But other, I'm sorry, I can't answer that. Uh, I have a few questions from Ariana Sutton Greer, but I think the one that I'll pick has to do with uh, wetlands having an impact on decreasing waves and wave energy. Uh, she was uh, mentioning a paper by Moeller et al. in 2014 in Nature mm -hmm. that showed that wetlands did have a big impact on decreasing waves and wave energy. And she shared if you were familiar with that or how that, that compares with um, your comments about wetlands. Um, yes, I'm familiar with it, and I think it's consistent with what I said. The um, the difficulty, I, as I see it, with wetlands, for example, is that um, the relative to wave height is important because wave break in shallow water anyway, even if the wetland wasn't there. Uh, height of the vegetation relative to water depth is important. So the more emergent or closer to the surface, the more effective they'll be. And the width of the vegetation region relative to the wavelength is important. So the thing that's hard, and I can't answer your question off the top of my head, is pick out all the various combinations of parameters that uh, they might be addressing. Um, but I certainly agree that, um, you know, the, the wetlands can be effective if, if they uh, are able to uh, get in the wave action zone up near the surface, if water depths are maintained pretty shallow, and if they're sufficiently wide. It's 1:30, so I think what I'll what I will do is, uh, unfortunately, I'm gonna I'm gonna end the formal part of the webinar. But you've been kind enough, um, or or, or mm -hmm. uh, you your email address, which which I'll assume means you'd welcome questions uh, through email or, or other Absolutely. means. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and to thank you again for just a wonderfully informative uh, webinar for us today. We really really appreciate it. And, well, thanks. And I appreciate it. Too. Thank you very much. And, and persevered through technical difficulties and bark dogs. So you get, <laughs> you get the Perseverance Award as well. Thank you, everybody. And, the, and again, this will be posted at, at sustainable, resilient infrastructure.org under presentations.
That's for his infrastructure.org presentations. Uh, we hope within the next week. And thanks again to Dr. Creeble. And I hope you have a day. Okay, thank you. Um, thanks, everybody. Thank you.